How could Christians worship a God who destroyed an entire nation of people? In Deuteronomy chapter 2, Moses testifies about God commanding him and the Israelites to set out now and cross the Arnon Gorge. See, I have given into your hand Sihon, the Amorite, king of Heshbon, and his country. Begin to take possession of it and engage him in battle. At that time, we took all his towns and completely destroyed them, men, women, and children. We left no survivors. Now take a look at this picture. These are the bones of a female child who had been buried in a pit, her bones arranged in an unorganized manner. She was killed by being sawn in half, along with two other girls who were decapitated. These three girls were all buried under a ritual site next to the skeletons of even more young girls who were killed, many of them burned to death. But it was not the Israelites who did this. The ancient city called Gezer was located west of Jerusalem in the Judean foothills. This city was occupied by the Amorites, who were descendants of the Canaanite people. Despite being massive in number and having a very strong military, by the year 1200 BC, the Amorites completely vanished from the pages of history. Why is that the case? In Genesis 15, we read about Abraham falling into a deep sleep. During this time, God appears to him and tells him that his descendants will inhabit the land of the Canaanites. However, this process would take four generations to happen because the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. What is this sin of the Amorites that God is referring to? This is Robert Alexander Stuart McAllister. He was an Irish archaeologist. In the year 1902, he set out for an excavation trip in Gezer. As he was slowly uncovering the land, he noticed a row of stones protruding from the ground. So he started to dig deeper. What he ended up unearthing were the remains of a Canaanite high place, referred to as a Bama in Hebrew. A Bama is an altar that is built on a hilltop and used for idol worship and sacrifice. This particular Bama in Gezer consisted of ten stones, many of which were well over ten feet tall. The stones were like pillars, and they were all arranged in a line going from south to north. Next to these stones was a basin made of limestone. Inside the basin and in the ground all around the basin were jars filled with the bones of young girls. McAllister estimated some of these girls to be less than a week old at the time they were sacrificed. The way in which they were sacrificed is even more chilling. In his careful examination, McAllister noticed burn marks all over the skulls of these infant girls some of whom had even been cut in half. He concluded that during these idol worship ceremonies, the Amorites would cut their children in half or burn them with fire in the basin made of limestone before stuffing their lifeless bodies into large clay jars and burying them in the ground next to the pillars. McAllister drew a diagram of the site and marked every single jar he found containing the remains of young girls with the letter J. In this diagram, we see that there are 10 different places marked with the letter J. Underneath this Bama, he discovered a cave with a flat stone that had been laid down. On the stone itself were the remains of even more sacrificed children. This form of idol worship was done in the hopes that, through sacrificing their child, 
the family would gain health, wealth, and prosperity. In the book of Leviticus, God commands the Israelites, You will not let any of your descendants pass through the fire of Moloch, nor will you profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Any Israelite or any foreigner residing in Israel who sacrifices any of his children to Moloch is to be put to death. And in Deuteronomy 12.31, he also says, You must not worship the Lord your God the way the other nations worship their gods, for they perform for their gods every detestable act that the Lord hates. They burn their sons and daughters as sacrifices to their gods. Being descendants of the Canaanites, the Amorite people worshipped Moloch as one of their many gods. The way in which this god was worshipped was primarily through child sacrifice, offered by fire. God waited hundreds of years for the Amorites to repent of their sin, but that day never came. What did come, however, was God's righteous judgment upon these Canaanite people. In Exodus 23, God refers directly to the Amorites by saying, For my angel will go before you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hivites, and Jebusites, so that you may live there. And I will destroy them completely. You must not worship the gods of these nations or serve them in any way or imitate their evil practices. Instead, you must utterly destroy them and smash their sacred pillars. Was it really justified for God to do this? A non-Christian might argue that it was not just for God to do this because the Amorites did not have his law like the Israelites did. They didn't know any better because God didn't specifically instruct them not to do these sorts of things. But how can that possibly be a good argument when even the Gentiles, who do not have God's written law, show that they know his law when they instinctively obey it, even without having heard it? They demonstrate that God's law is written in their hearts, for their own conscience and thoughts either accuse them or tell them that they are doing right. Did the Amorites know that what they were doing was wrong? Of course they did. Even the atheists, who argue there is no God, claim to know the difference between right and wrong through their conscience alone. And if the atheists can agree that the practices of the Amorites were indeed evil, then how can we call God unjust for punishing that evil? God is just, and everyone is without excuse. This stuff is real. These things actually happened, and the evidence is buried right beneath the soil that we walk on. I'm speaking for myself first when I say that we are all guilty of the sin of the Amorites through the way in which we have practiced idolatry ourselves. Abortion, pornography, money, material possessions, relationships, our health, our physical appearance. At one point, we have all made a sacrifice to these idols. But the God of the Bible doesn't require a sacrifice from us. He has already made the sacrifice for us on the cross. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Until next time, Salam.